Uh, we are live. Okay. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Uh, we are here for the Oculoplasty uh, module number seven, and we are continuing with the lecture. So it is in two sessions. So if you go to our playlist uh, on the social media portals, you can see it as the second uh, session for the day, which is evaluation of the congenital ptosis. We have just finished with the anatomy of the eyelid parts two, and uh, we'll take the questions toward the end of this lecture. So over to you, sir. Okay, this, uh, this part will cover uh, evaluation of uh, congenital ptosis and I would keep it fairly brief. Whenever we have a patient of ptosis in front of us, we have to ask these questions and answer these answers before we proceed with decision making. What is the severity of ptosis? Are there any complicating factors such as say a patient who has monocular elevation deficit, a dry eye, poor corneal sensation, which would implicate Im we kind of have an implication on the surgical outcome and the complications. What surgery would I do in this patient? Is the surgery that I'm going to do safe for the patient or would it produce any complications? What is the expected outcome? Would I be able to fully correct this patient or would I purposefully leave this patient slightly undercorrected, having explained that to the patient already? To answer these questions and arrive at a surgical decisions, you have to go through a series of evaluations, which would begin with history, of course. Now, age of onset, of course, in congenital ptosis, it is not relevant at all. It is by birth. But in acquired ptosis, age of onset is important because that would indicate the etiology. Of acquired ptosis, of course, would be covered separately in the next lecture. But just to give a basis, in acquired ptosis, it could be acute, subacute, or chronic. In acqu acute acquired ptosis, generally the etiology would be neurogenic. If it is over a period of weeks, then possibly it would be myogenic, chronic, definitely you should think of aponeurotic. So acute, subacute and chronic, each of this would have an implication on the possible etiology. Now, you should also ask whether the patient had ptosis in one eye first and then it became bilateral or if both eyes started having drooping at the same time, again, this would have implication on the diagnosis of acquired ptosis. Rest of the history in congenital ptosis, of course, the history is by birth and you can only ask about history of variable ptosis. When the patient, when a child feeds or when the child is verbalizing or talking, is there any variation in the amount of ptosis? That will Im imply that the patient may have synchinesis. In acquired ptosis, there are other history to ask progression. If a patient has acute onset ptosis and that starts improving over a period of time, again, that is neurogenic because neurogenic ptosis sometimes can recover over a period of time. If it is gradually worsening, then it is either myogenic or aponeurotic. Any history of trauma prior to surgery, medications, especially topical steroids, if any, and any systemic symptoms such as dysphasia, change in voice would indicate that the patient would have myogenic ptosis. In congenital ptosis, family history can be important. Patients who have blepharophimosis can have inherited ptosis. Patients who don't have blepharophimosis can also have inherited ptosis. Autosomal dominant and recessive both are known. This father has blepharophimosis, child also has blepharophimosis. This mother has unilateral ptosis in the left eye, son has bilateral severe ptosis. So ptosis can be inherited. In a patient who does not give you a very clear history, you should ask for older photographs. This patient comes and tells you that she has ptosis, which she noted during childhood. But when we reviewed her childhood photographs, she never had ptosis when she was a child. Only when she was a teenager did ptosis start developing, so indicating that it was possibly an aponeurotic ptosis. Now, as the patient talks to you, as you elicit history, you should look at facial animations. This patient has very severe frontalis overaction. You can see horizontal furrows in the frontal area, which indicates that she is trying to lift the lid of course, she has good frontal frontalis action. At the same time, her ptosis is very severe because of which she is trying to lift the lid and uncover the pupillary axis. So any patient who has severe frontalis overaction 
would mean that the patient has severe ptosis and poor levator action. Also, as the patient talks to you, if the ptosis is variable, that indicates several things. What are the ptosis that are variable? Tuju? Uh, sir, uh, ptosis with synkinesis. Uh... Okay. As the patient talks to you, if the ptosis is variable, what all does it mean? Myasthenia, of course, would have dynal variation and fatigability. Synkinesis is one. Anything else? This is clearly variable. As the patient talks to you, as the patient opens the mouth and closes the mouth, the patient will have variability of ptosis. Then you expect synchinesis. Any other indications or any other possibilities for a variable ptosis? Aberrant regeneration of third nerve. So whenever a patient has paralytic ptosis and if there is aberrant regeneration, then that would vary. Excellent levator action, patient can control. Gain ptosis can vary. As the patient talks to you, as the patient uses his frontal or uses the elevator, then you can expect variability of ptosis. Expressionless face is an indicator of myogenic ptosis. Now, going on to evaluation, you always start with evaluation of the face. As we already mentioned, you should look for frontal is overaction and also variability of ptosis with facial animations, which should indicate the presence of synchinesis or apparent regeneration of the third nerve. Third nerve palsy can also be congenital and these patients can have aberrant regeneration. Then you look at the palpable fissure itself. You should measure palpable fissure in three cases. Primary position would be an indirect indicator of the amount of ptosis, palpable fissure in up gaze and down gaze. Titi, can you explain the significance of evaluating palpable fissure in up gaze and down gaze? Quickly. Uh, sir, in up case and down, uh, so in evaluating the palpable fissure in up case, we can assess the amount of levator function that is uh, 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 present in the patient. No, and... levator function is a dynamic assessment. When the patient looks from extreme down gaze to extreme up gaze, you get a fair idea of levator action. But when you look at the palpable fissure itself in up case, if right eye is totic and you ask the patient to look up, is there any significance at all? In which, which category of patients would the palpable fissure be higher in the totic side than the non-totic side when the patient looks up? Not sure. Two categories. One is synchinesis, second is aberrant regeneration. What about palpable fissure in down gaze? How does it help? Congenital. In congenital ptosis, levator is dystrophic. So when the patient looks down, the totic side would look larger as compared to the non-totic side. Whereas in aponeurotic ptosis, since the muscle is lax, dehiscent or disinserted, then the totic side would have narrow palpable fissure in down gaze as compared to the non-totic side. Now, give me examples of three or four conditions of acquired ptosis where the palpable fissure would be wider in down gaze. So it is standard mm -hmm. that palpable fissure is going to be wider in down gaze in congenital ptosis except one variant of congenital ptosis, that is aponeurotic variant of congenital ptosis, which is caused by trauma, like a forceps delivery or prolonged birth parturition where the child is born with eyelid edema and damage to the levator palpebrae superioris. That is one etiology where there would be narrow palpable fissure and down gaze despite the ptosis being congenital. Similarly, in acquired ptosis, it is understood that the palpable fissure will be narrow in down gaze acquired aponeurotic ptosis. I'm asking you to give examples of acquired ptosis where palpable fissure will be wider in down gaze. In uh, cases of thyroid eye disease. Acquired aponeurotic. Acquired ptosis where the palpable fissure will be wider in down gaze. 
trauma where there is tethering, mm-hmm. roof fracture, for example. Mm-hmm. Second is infiltration of the levator, such as non-specific orbital inflammation. Third is metastasis from a scleros sclerosing malignancy, such as breast carcinoma, breast carcinoma, breast or stomach cancer, where there would be tethering of the levator. superiorly so three or four indications or also in patients who have aberrant regeneration where the palpable fissure can be wider when the patient looks down so otherwise palpable fissure in primary position is taken as a only as an indirect indicator of the amount of ptosis why is that why can't it tell you the exact amount of ptosis suppose palpable fissure is say 6 mm in the right eye and 10 mm in the left eye can you simply say that amount of ptosis in the right eye is 4 mm uh, we also need to consider the lower lid position right so palpable fissure in primary position would mean that the dis- distance between the upper eyelid and lower eyelid in the pupillary axis is 6 mm if the lower eyelid is retracted down then you would be overestimating or underestimating the amount of ptosis depending on the position of the lower eyelid lower lid eyelid can be higher lower eyelid can be lower than normal so it is the lower eyelid that actually changes your measurement so to eliminate that component of error you depend on margin reflex distance So MRD one is the true measure of ptosis. How exactly is MRD one measured? So, uh, with the with what are the testing conditions? With the patient seated upright, looking um, at uh, a distant, giving having instructed him to look at a distant uh, object or giving him a distance fixation. In what the, distance fixation would you give? Um, looking at a TV screen at six meters. Right. So six by sixty target. you know in a vision chart would be a good distance fixation to give because the patient is expected to take off the glasses when you do it so if there is refractive error also you should be able to see the top letter of the vision chart so you give a distant fixation and what should of what kind of illumination do you want do you want a bright torch right. light focused on the patient's face no sir no you want soft illumination diffuse illumination just good enough for you to see the reading on the scale but not to cause photophobia to the patient patient should be completely relaxed and head should be straight chin should not be pointing down or up frontal eye should be completely relaxed you should ask the patient to relax the frontal eyes or stroke the supra row area reasonable number of time to relax the frontal eyes make sure that the patient is completely relaxed before you measure mrd1 so where exactly do you measure mrd1 which part of the palpable fissure uh, in the central part of the palpable fissure right so you cannot measure the distance between the medial canthus and the lateral canthus divided by 2 and mark the center of the eyelid that will be two levels generally all measurements of the lid are taken at the pupillary axis so if you are taken at the pupillary axis you would be right so palpable fissure vertical palpable fissure in primary position down gaze up gaze mrd1 mrd2 everything is measured in relationship typically with the pupillary axis so you hold a transparent scale while the patient is still fixing with the other eye so you should not obstruct the patient's visual axis in the contralateral eye he should still be fixing with the other eye and you simply measure off the distance of the upper eyelid from the light reflex right the light reflex should be caused by a diffuse illumination which comes straight on ahead of the patient it should not be an oblique illumination so if you use a lamp or a diffuse lamp which is mounted on your examination console it should come straight on the face of the patient not from the side so corneal reflex and the upper eyelid margin scale being aligned at the pupillary axis you measure mrd1 similarly you measure mrd1 in the other eye 
So if the MRD one in the right eye, which is non-totic, is 4.5 millimeter, and MRD one in the totic eye is 2 millimeter, what is the amount of ptosis? You simply minus one from the other. Right. What if a patient has a negative MRD? If a patient has seven millimeter ptosis, how do you measure MRD? Having placed scale in the pupillary uh, axis, uh, same testing conditions, we just hmm. lift the lid of the patient and observe for the first appearance of the Hirschberg's reflex. Yes. Yeah. So the amount of lid that needs to be lifted to unravel the reflex is negative MRD. So then you mark MRD as minus one, minus two, or minus three, whatever is the amount of lid that needs to be lifted with the scale in position that needs to be lifted to get the pupillary reflex or Hirschberg's reflex. That is MRD1. MRD2. Shefali, what is MRD2? So the distance uh, from the center of the pupil to the lower lid margin is MRD2. Center of the pupil, light reflex. Yeah. Light reflex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the uh, lower lid margin is MRD2. Exactly. Correct. So how, how does it help you? So if, uh, as we talked about, if the lower lid is not lying exactly on the inferior limbus, there's a scleral show. So we need to measure MRD1 and MRD2 because there might be an asymmetry and then only we can comment, comment upon the ptosis. Right. So MRD2 is a measure of lower lid retraction or lower lid inverse ptosis. And what is MRD3, Ruju? It's the measurement in extreme up gaze from mm -hmm. the upper lid to the uh, reflex, light reflex, corneal. Corneal reflex. So it is not in the pupillary axis. This is not pupillary light reflex. It can be anywhere. It could even be at the limbus in extreme up gaze, right? So who described MRD3 and what is its clinical implication? It indirectly signifies the LPS action. Mm -hmm. It was described by Putterman and everything is written on the slide. Hmm? It is called margin eye distance. So you can see in this slide that the patient is trying to look up and the reflex is here. So this is the distance that you measure as MRD 3, right? So now abnormal MRD 3, that is in a patient who has Ptosis MRD3 minus normal MRD3 multiplied by 3. Use the amount of LPS resection that you need to do in a patient who has monocular elevation deficit. That is all. So this was devised only to estimate the amount of levator resection that needs to be done in a patient who has elevators under action, double elevator under action or monocular elevation deficit. And this was devised by Putterman. This is not a part of routine ptosis evaluation. So in exams, often residents are asked, what is MRD3? Have you done MRD3? Well, it is not a part of routine ptosis evaluation. Even if you do in a normal patient or a patient with ptosis, it does not give you any additional information that you can practically use. So we talked about MRD1, we talked about MRD2, and we talked about MRD3. Now, what about herrings? Why have I written it in this slide and what is its implication? What do you do exactly? You want to know how would herrings affect the outcome or the measure of your ptosis? Tuju. Keep yourself unmuted. You're going to answer a lot of questions. Sir, you basically lift the totic lid and see the... Where, where, where? When you answer such questions, you have to be very specific. Lift the totic lid to where? To the normal position. Normal position, enough. The you need to generally lift it to the limbus. Okay, and then what do you do when you? So you have to first measure MRD one, both in the right eye and in the left eye. Suppose right eye is totic, you lift the right totic lid to the limbus, and see what is happening to the left eye. If the left eye was retracting before you lifted the right eyelid, right? Either it could be primary eyelid retraction or because of 
excessive innervation, correct? So differentiate from primary eyelid retraction in the what appears to be contralateral eyelid or if it is because of excessive innervation, you do the Herring's test. When you lift the totic lid to the limbus, if the other eyelid comes down to its normal position, which is two millimeter from the limbus, that means that there was excessive innervation. That is one implication. Second is that if a patient has aponeurotic ptosis, asymmetric, more in the right eye than in the left eye, when you lift the right lid to the limbus, if the lid, left eyelid becomes further droopy and has manifest ptosis, which is significant, then you should counsel the patient for bilateral surgery. Or if the patient does not agree for bilateral simultaneous surgery, you should at least tell the patient that when we lift the right eyelid to its non-totic position, you will possibly have manifest ptosis in the other eyelid and you may need surgery for the other eyelid. So to unravel subclinical ptosis in the contralateral eyelid in a patient who has aponeurotic or even myogenic ptosis, you do the herrings. Right? You elicit herrings if the patient has excessive herrings. It's just an elicit, uh, just a test to see if the patient has eyelid retraction because of excessive innervation or mass ptosis because of excessive innervation to unravel, unravel that. Now, based on MRD1, you have ptosis which can be classified as mild, moderate, severe. Two, three, four is what you need to remember. Next measure is levator action. How exactly do you measure levator action? Can you tell? Uh, so we've asked the patient to look in the extreme down gaze and- What is the, the testing device? condition? Uh, the patient... All that we mentioned earlier is fine, but beyond that, is there anything else that you need to do? You should have a flat back to rest the patient's head. Otherwise, when you- hmm. Block. obscure or uh, press on the suprabro area to eliminate frontal ace action, the patient's head will become unsteady and the patient will move back. So steady head position is very important. So you should have a backrest for the head when you do levator action, right? Go ahead. And also we should negate any action of the frontalis muscle and- uh, How do you do that? So we stabilize, uh, so first we ask the patient to relax and we uh, can place uh, uh, our thumb above the blow to prepare, to realize. Do you do that the... unilaterally or bilaterally? So ideally we should do it bilaterally, but for Ideally we should we do need... bilaterally, then you would need an assistant as well, mm -hmm. right? So assistant, yes. if at all you use an assistant, assistant can come from the back of the patient and press on the suprapro area to negate the frontalis action. Then you ask the patient, then you hold a transparent scale, ask the patient to look extreme down and extreme up. So how exactly do you define levator action? Uh, the, um, uh, the, we'll note the movement of the lid margin from the extreme down gaze to the extreme up gaze and based on that uh, excursion, we yeah. classify maximum the maximum excursion of the eyelid mm -hmm. from extreme down gaze to extreme up gaze with frontal is negated is defined as the levator action. And based on the levator action that you measure, you can measure it multiple number of times to be sure what you're measuring is correct. You can classify levator action as poor, fair, and good. Three to four is considered poor. Less than two millimeter or equal to two millimeter is generally contributed by the superior rectus itself. So it is considered zero as far as the practical implication of levator action is concerned. Five to seven is fair, more than seven is good. That is one way of classifying by beard. Now current books classify, current classification is zero to four as poor, five to seven as fair, 12 to 15 as good, and more than 15 as excellent or normal. So that's how you classify levator action. And based on that, you can customize a particular surgery to the patient. What is frontalis action? Why do you need to measure it? Super. Um, sir, in uh, cases of uh, to decide in cases of poor MPS, we need to decide if the lid can be elevated by the action of the frontalis itself and uh, to consider versus a sling surgery. And uh, in a cases of uh, 
poor frontal is actually then we will have to consider a retinal's uh, sling correct so to measure frontal is actually you mark a dot on the suprabrow area is exactly in the pupillary axis and ask the patient to extremely elevate the eyelid unilaterally or bilaterally then you measure the excursion of the brow right so anything about 10 mm of frontal is action is considered adequate to perform a tarsal frontal sling less than that you have the risk of patient not using frontal is at all thus your sling running into under correction now explain these terms to our margin crease distance tarsal platform show pro fax pack so margin crease uh, margin crease distance is the uh, distance um, between the lid crease to the uh, upper lid to the upper lid margin to the lid crease um, when testing condition when the patient is uh, how exactly do you measure margin crease distance we request the patient to uh, begin when whenever the patient begins to just look up and the lid the uh, so patient should be looking down first down, down first and ask the patient to gently look up very look slowly up. yeah your scale is already in position at the putative pupillary axis yes then the first so, prominent Still. decrease that appears when the patient looks from extreme down gaze to up gaze is the margin crease distance it's the first prominent lid crease that appears if a patient has multiple lid creases the most prominent lid crease is taken as the for the measurement of the margin crease distance the yes. first prominent lid crease that appears is mcd whereas tarsal platform shows in the prime, measured in the primary case mm -hmm. and uh, is the where to where is the distance between the upper lid uh, margin to mm -hmm. the um, to the uh, the lower most border of uh, lower most border of the overhanging lid skin lid skin right, right? so lid skin always overhangs the lid crease especially in elderly individuals or patients who have blepharocalcis or dermatocalcis in a child it may not be so right so there is a difference between margin crease distance and tarsal platform show this is the same patient you can see when the patient is looking from extreme down gaze to slightly higher this is the margin crease distance distance of the upper lid margin to the most prominent lid crease that appears first in the pupillary axis is the margin crease distance same patient when he this is about say 8 9 mm when the patient looks in primary position what is happening this skin is overhanging the line of lid crease right so this measure from the lid margin to the apex of the overhang is considered as tarsal platform show so this is the epitarsal show that the patient has this is important in patients who are undergoing blepharoplasty because they expect a certain amount of or asian uh, lid crease surgery they expect a certain amount of tarsal platform show and you have to give it by fixing this epitarsal skin to the epitarsal tissue so that they have this allotted amount of tarsal platform show what is bfs a uh, profat span is the distance uh, between and the inferior border of the eyebrow to the uh, uh, uppermost point of the uh, lid crease or the lid fold the same point that you take for tarsal platform show is also taken to measure the profat span profat span yeah so we had certain other things here what is vertical lid height how is it important vertical lid height is typically measured when the patient is looking down again in the pupillary axis distance between the upper lid margin and the lowermost position of the brow if a patient has indistinct brow has plucked the brow you can always take the superior orbital margin for measuring this distance in males because the lower border of the brow corresponds to the superior orbital margin in males and it's about 3 to 4 mm higher in females 
anyway you have to measure the vertical lid height because in blepharoplasty you are supposed to keep at least 18 19 mm of the vertical lid height intact when you excise skin second is that if a patient has relative blepharophimosis vertical lid height becomes important in patients who have say contracted socket congenital contracted socket because of microphthalmos etc if they have ptosis again vertical lid height is important because they may not have equal amount of vertical lid height as compared to the normal eye. So vertical lid height is an indicator of vertical contraction of the upper eyelid in patients who have blepharophimosis or congenital and ophthalmos with contracted socket. It also will relatively tell you as to how much skin you need to excise to leave at least 18 millimeter of the vertical lid height intact. What is vertical tarsal height and why is that important? Vertical tarsal height is the uh, maximum uh, in the uh, central pupillary axis uh, when we measure the uh, uh, the height of the tarsus. Uh, How is to, it measured? Uh, so when we evert the eyelid hmm. and we see uh, the uh, lowermost border of the tarsus to the uh, uppermost border of the tarsus oh. to the uh, lower border of the tarsus. Why is it important? So in condition, like if it's too... Uh, huge it can uh, there can be a condition like tarsal ectropion where it it is unstable and it can lead to ectropion mm -hmm. or floppy eyelids it will be no? and uh, we need Which surgery do you decide based on this fast uh, less avert procedure less avert, huh? yeah, the patient should have at least 8 millimeter of the <laughs> vertical tarsal height if a patient has 2 millimeter ptosis because for every millimeter of ptosis you resect 4 millimeter of the tarsus and the patient should have at least 4 millimeter of the tarsus left behind for a stable eyelid in a patient who undergoes fast less avert procedure although this procedure is rare you have to measure vertical tarsal height in every patient with ptosis so that you have a fair idea as to what you are dealing with Next is skin quality. In a patient who has blepharochalasis or dermatochalasis, you should assess the skin quality. If the skin is excess and also is thin and it is of not of good texture and quality, you may want to do blepharoplasty along with process surgery. Lower retraction we already talked about. You should also assess lag of thalmus and orbicularis function because that will have implication on post-operative corneal exposure. So all these crucial information has to be derived in a patient who has ptosis. We already talked about this. Next is synchinosis. Now, uh, Ruju will explain everything about how do we elicit synchinosis, what is synchinosis, how do we elicit synchinosis, and what is Marcus Gen phenomenon. Ruju ji. Sir, synchinesis is um, hmm. simultaneous, synchronous co-contraction of a different group of muscles innervated by different nerves. Perfect. Hmm. And, you want to uh, repeat it for people to understand. The definition is very important. Hmm. Um, and Marcus Gunn is... Do you want to repeat the... it? Do you want to repeat the definition? Yes, sir. Sir, it is simultaneous, synchronous co-contraction of different group of muscles innervated by different nerves. Hmm. And uh, Marcus Gunn jaw winking is when there is a change in lead position, when there is a uh, simultaneous contraction of its uh, contralateral lateral pterygoid muscle. Okay, so it is contralateral or ipsilateral lateral pterygoid. Which one? Contralateral. Contralateral. Ipsilateral, uh, lateral pterygoid and uh, contralateral side movement. Right. So lateral pterygoid, when you want to elicit the action of lateral pterygoid, the patient, suppose right eye is totic and you expect synchinesis in the right eye, the jaw has to move to the left eye to use the lateral pterygoid muscle. Correct? Mm -hmm. So the jaw will move to the opposite side than the eye with process and your eyelid moves. That is testing the action of the lateral pterygoid. So if a patient has synchinesis with lateral pterygoid muscle, that is called typically Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomena. But the synchinesis can be with any muscle of mastication. It can be with any muscle of facial expression. It could be with mylohyoid, it could be with digastric, it could be with medial pterygoid, in which case you move the jaw on the same side. It could be with buccinator, it could be with temporalis. 
so we have to go through all the muscles of mastication and facial expression to rule out the presence of synchinesis especially in a patient with variable tosis so whenever we mention synchinesis we also mention which muscle it is likely to be synchinetic with and also the amount of synchinesis how do you classify or quantify synchinesis mild moderate severe mild moderate severe less than 2 2 to 5 and more than 5 this is by measurement there is a clinical way of quantifying synchinesis also if the totic lid lifts from totic to non totic position then that is mild if the totic lid lifts from totic position to the upper limbus that is moderate if it lifts enough to show sclera that is scleral show that is severe so there are both ways of quantifying synchinesis quantity in terms of measurement and quantification in terms of the position of the upper lid in relationship to these landmarks then ocular motility of course you have to document ocular motility if a patient has vertical strabismus that needs special mention and also if a patient has hypotropia then you should definitely look for pseudotosis pseudotosis can be either because of lack of mechanical support like a patient with a prosthetic eye will have pseudotosis and the moment you correct the volume of the prosthetic eye the ptosis may be alleviated that is one form of pseudotosis the second form of pseudotosis is this when this patient has monocular elevation deficit it's very clear you can see that left eye is totic and she is not able to elevate the left eye now in this patient you have to measure ptosis with both right eye fixing and left eye fixing now with the right eye fixing you measure mrd1 in the right eye with the left eye fixing when you measure you can see that the amount of ptosis has certainly reduced right because her hypotropia gets corrected she is fixing with the left eye and when you measure ptosis the amount of true ptosis gets manifest the true ptosis that she has is much less than the pseudo ptosis that she has so if at all you want to do levator resection or any ptosis surgery in this patient you have to correct only true ptosis and how do you achieve that you have to first do extraocular muscle surgery if that is possible at all bring the eye to optimal position whatever that is possible in a patient with monocular elevation deficit squint surgery may be difficult may be unpredictable but whatever it is give her the best possible vertical squint correction then only you attempt ptosis surgery it's very important and also in a patient who has monocular elevation deficit if they want to recess the inferior rectus you should tell your squint specialist that capsulopapillary uh, head of the inferior rectus has to be taken care of it has to be reinserted back not recess along with the inferior rectus so the lower lid position is maintained otherwise the patient will have lower lid retraction yeah. like this patient has okay so that is pseudotosis so whenever a patient has vertical strabismus you have to pay specific attention to, to pseudotosis by measuring ptosis with right eye fixing and the left eye fixing and eliciting the true amount of ptosis now the next bit is about bell's phenomena how do you elicit bell's phenomena and how do you quantify what are the types of bell's phenomena who wants to answer did mm -hmm. So for eliciting the Bell's phenomena, we will um, uh, hold uh, with both our uh, thumbs. We will uh, ask the patient to shut their eyelids uh, when we are um, offering resistance. Offering resistance, and we will see the motion of the cornea. Mm -hmm. Usually, in normal Bell's phenomena, it should the cornea should move upward and outward, and uh, uh, a good in a good Bell's phenomena, we will not be able to see the cornea because it will be complete. Mm -hmm. more anybody wants to correct her anybody what is reverse what is inverse first the reverse will be if uh, the eye is going down and out mm -hmm. down anywhere in or out ah down um or it can even move Up and Up in. 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 Hmm. Okay, so quantification is good, fair, and poor. Poor is if less than two thirds of the cornea disappears under the 
lifted upper lid. Upper lid has to be lifted to the limbus. Right? Less than two thirds. Two thirds to one third is fair. More than one third is good. Bell's phenomena has to be quantified. If it is poor, then obviously you have to be careful when you correct doses because such patients will have higher chance of corneal exposure. If the bells is reversed, again, you have to be careful because such patients have a higher chance of corneal exposure. Next is eyelashes. Eyelashes are supposed to point up and out. If the eyelashes are horizontal or if they're pointing down and that's called lash doses. In a patient with lash, to lash doses, it's important either to fix the lashes by passing epitassal sutures if you're doing an anterior approach levator is surgery or any tosis surgery and avoid posterior approach surgery in these patients because lash tosis will get exacerbated if you do a posterior approach surgery. Tear function has to be measured and corneal sensation has to be measured to complete the evaluation. And the last is about drug test. Rest of the drug test will be described with uh, evaluation of acquired tosis, but phenylephrine test is something that you can do even in congenital tosis to see if a patient can be operated by doing mullerectomy. <laughs> Typically, 2.5% phenylephrine has to be used, but it really doesn't matter if you use 5 or 10%. But the only problem that will happen with higher concentration is that there will be sudden pupillary dilatation. Phenylephrine works very fast. And before, uh, if, you, if your observation, extended observation is required, then the pupil will di dilate. So it may impact your measure of doses, but it really doesn't matter as long as you use the corneal right reflex. So any concentration can be used, ideally 2.5 millimeter. You should put this drop in the superior phonics, not in the inferior phonics, the way you normally put the drop. Uh, after having measured MRD1, you instill phenylephrine in the superior phonics, ask the patient to keep the lid closed for two minutes, and any elevation of the lid by more than two millimeters, especially patients who have late responders have to be looked for at five and 10 minutes. And at the end of 30 minutes, if the patient does not have any uh, elevation of the lid at all, then it can be declared negative. You wouldn't know which patient is a late responder. So it's always a good idea to look for measurements again at the end of 30 minutes if the initial test is negative. The initial test is positive. If the patient has lifted it two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes, you don't have to do an extended observation. If a patient doesn't lift at two, millimeter, two minutes or five or 10 minutes, it's a good idea to measure again at the end of 30 minutes in any way when you look at the fundus post dilatation to see if there is any change at all and declare the test as negative. So this is useful in patients who where you want to perform a mullerectomy procedure. Last bit is about patients who have con other concurrent problems such as blepharophimosis, blepharophimosis, telecanthus, and epicanthus inverse have to be documented. In such patients, additional measurements are that you have to measure interpupillary distance and intermedial canthal distance. Intermedial canthal distance, more than 50% of interpupillary distance is a definition of telecanthus. These patients could still have hypertellurism, so you have to palpate the medial orbital margin, measure interorbital distance. If the interorbital distance is more, inter intraorbital distance is more than interorbital distance, you can suspect clinically that these patients will have hypertellurism, and that is confirmed, of course, on a CT scan by doing interterion distance measurement. So that's about blepharophimosis. In patients with blepharophimosis, you also have to measure the horizontal palpebral pedal fissure, mm -hmm. medial limbus to medial canthal distance, and lateral limbus to lateral canthal distance to determine which procedure you're going to do, medial canthoplasty, lateral canthoplasty, or both. So uh, last of all, I just summarize it by showing a video. Hope it plays. Clinical examination is the most important part in the management of ptosis. A good history and evaluation of a patient in the clinic can give us essential information on type of ptosis, degree of severity, complicating factors like limitation of extraocular movements. And is the sound heard or not when I showed the video? Yes. yes? 
sound is hurt sir but uh, my speaker is stuck at the bps picture yes, so the video has not opened yet not opened yet no sir in kinesis the type of surgery and the um i'll start it again sir so actually the screen uh, right now is showing a bps picture the last one oh, really hmm. i'll reshare why is it happening Exit. So I can share. Yeah, you have you you share it. Want. Yeah, sure. It's your video anyway. Yeah. You have it readily. Yeah, I have it. I'm just sharing it. Okay. Is that visible? Yes. Yeah. With sound, you share it. Clinical examination is the most important part of history and evaluation of a patient in the clinic can give us essential information on type of doses, degree of severity, any complicating factor, and the amount of correction desired, safety of the surgery, and the expected outcome. Patient or the parents should be asked about the onset of doses, the mode of onset, progression of doses, any history of trauma, recurrent swelling of the eyelid, allergic conjunctivitis, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, previous eye surgeries, and use of rigid contact lenses. Certain medications can cause doses. The birth history, diurnal variation, dysphagia or recent change in voice could be indicative of myasthenia gravis. Doses worsening in the morning and improving as the day progresses is characteristic of inflammatory conditions like blepharocalysis. Family history may be positive in patients with BPES. Old photographs are useful in identifying the age of onset and variability of doses. The examination of a patient should include the following. The visual acuity should be assessed by age-appropriate methods. Doses can cause amblyopia due to astigmatism, strabismus, or form deprivation. Pigmentary retinopathy can be found in patients with chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Visual feeds should be done to document peripheral and superior field restriction. Lateral of doses, facial asymmetry, any abnormal head posture, chin elevation, and frontalis overaction, facial dysmorphism in patients with BPES, skin quality should be assessed in dermatokinesis, blepharokinesis, and prolapsed lacrimal gland, brow ptosis, Lash ptosis, mechanical causes of ptosis, strabismus or enophthalmos with resultant pseudotosis, extraocular movements, tear function tests, and corneal sensations. We will now describe the different measurements to be taken in a patient with ptosis. Measurements should be taken in a normally illuminated room with the patient in the upright position, head straight looking at a fixed point at eye level, at a distance with the examiner's eye at the same level. 
frontalis should be relaxed and pupils should be undilated. The palpebral fissure height is measured in line with the pupil in primary up. Margin reflex distance is measured from the eyelid crease to the corneal light reflex. MRD1 is the margin reflex distance from the upper lip. MRD2 is the distance measured from the lower lid. MRD3 is the upper lid in the case to the ocular reflex. This was described by Putterman. Based on MRD1, two cysts can be classified as mild, moderate, and severe. Clinically, the amount of ptosis can be graded by a method described by Beard. Margin crease distance is measured by asking the patient to look down and then slowly look up till the first prominent crease just appears on the skin of the upper eyelid. Lid crease is displaced upwards when LPS aponeurosis is disinserted. It is faint or absent in cases of congenital ptosis. Levator action should be tested by measuring the excursion of the upper lid from extreme down gaze to extreme up gaze with the frontalis negated. LPS excursion has been graded by Beard into the following severity. LPS action not only determines the type of surgery to be done, but also the amount of process to be corrected without causing over or under correction. Tarsal platform show is measured in the primary gaze it is the amount of tarsus visible between the lid margin and the eyelid crease. Brow fat span is measured in the primary gaze with the lower border of the eyebrow to the upper lid crease. Vertical lid height is the entire span of the upper lid measured with the patient looking downwards from the superior orbital rim. The vertical tarsal height is measured after everting the eyelid in the center, preferably using a slit lamp. Bell's phenomenon is tested with the patient looking in primary gates. The upper eyelid is lifted up to the superior limbus and the patient is asked to gently close his eyes. Normally, the eyeball moves upwards and outwards on closure of the eyes. Grading of Bell's is based on the amount of cornea disappearing under the upper eyelid. Lag of thalamus is measured by asking the patient to gently close the eyes. Herring's phenomenon is based on the Herring's law of equal innervation. When the totic eyelid is manually lifted to the superior limbus, the eyelid of the other eye droops. The chances of ptosis becoming apparent in the seemingly normal eye should be explained to the patient. Frontalis action is tested by asking the patient to elevate the eyebrows as much as possible in the primary case. Patients with poor frontalis action will not benefit with the tarsofrontalis sling. Fatigue test is done in cases of suspected myogenic ptosis like myasthenia brevis. There are two ways of doing the test. In the first one, the patient is asked the upper eyelid is asked to follow the examiner's fingers as he rapidly moves it up and down 10 times. Difference of 2 millimeters is significant. For ice test, ice pack is placed over the closed eyelid for 2 minutes. The palpebral fissure height is measured immediately. An improvement of 2 millimeter is considered significant. Synchinesis should be documented by noting the improvement in ptosis with the movement of muscle of mastication. Most commonly, it is with the nerve to lateral pterygoid, and that is called Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomenon. Amount of synchinesis can be classified as mild, moderate, and severe. Synchinesis can be graded clinically based on the improvement in position of the toptic eyelid. Every case of ptosis is challenging and different from the other. It must be tackled individually. A good history and correct examination can help formulate the management approach, both to the satisfaction of the surgeon and the patient. So don't let ptosis bring you down. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much, Mritika, for sharing that amazing video. If you want to 
uh, watch this video again. Uh, it's available along with an, like a gold mine of amazing video that says uh, YouTube channel, uh, which is open for all. So you can actually go and like have a look again for all the postgraduate students because you might have missed few important points. Uh, and thank you so much, sir, for that uh, very, very elaborate yet uh, a very uh, 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 like a crisp uh, lecture for uh, covering all the important points. Uh, I'll just take a few questions, uh, although the anatomical questions have been covered uh, along with the practical aspects. So just for our postgraduate students, when we do an aponeurotic ptosis surgery, uh, can you please touch upon like what all the pathological variations that we see in the levator muscles? One we see is uh, either they could be dehiscence or they could be disinsertion. And um, well, there are variations as well. If there are two layers of the aponeurosis, they could be differential disinsertion. One layer may still be attached and the other layer may be disinserted. And in dehiscence again, there could be dehiscence duration. Degeneration could be associated with both disinsertion and dehiscence. Then degeneration is nothing but fat infiltration of the levator, especially the muscular component of the levator that will have a bearing on the passage of sutures because in fat infiltrated muscle is not tectonically strong and also the amount of correction, these tend to undercorrect. Thank you. Uh, and sir, uh, uh, is there any, anat like there is anatomical variation, any points to remember when we are doing blepharoplasty in an Asian eyelid? Like there are separate articles which touch upon Asian eyelid, blepharoplasty, double eyelid uh, crease formation. So any important pointers for that? Pointer is that they expect a shorter tarsal platform show because you don't want to kind of make them different from their, you know, um, normal facial whatever variations so if they have if they don't have a lid crease at all or if the tacit platform is very very small their lid crease is hanging down to the lashes then obviously they would come to you for blepharoplasty but you should not uh, kind of give them a very high tacit platform show like seven or eight millimeter would make them look different from rest of their racial counterparts so you should aim at a physiological position for the tarsal platform show and you should discuss with them you know you can actually simulate the height of the lid crease by using a curved instrument which is actually used to simulate the lid crease it's an instrument that is available or you can buy with use your finger or a cotton tip applicator and lift and show them where exactly the lid crease is going to be and preoperatively counsel them as to what kind of lid crease that do they want and what kind of tarsal platform show do they want and create a lid crease at that particular height. Another question is uh, related to BPES. Uh, when we are doing, suppose it's covering the visual axis, should we do it as a staged procedure or can we correct the uh, basically all the components of BPES? We'll, we'll discuss all that when we come to surgeries, but typically staged procedure is uh, something that will give you the best of cosmesis. If a patient has visual axis covered, then I would... If the patient is not appropriate for blepharophimosis correction, I would simply do a, a temporary tarsofrontal sling for the patient so that visual axis is exposed and head posture and chin elevation is alleviated. So once the patient is about six, seven, eight years of age, then you can do blepharophimosis correction. And following that, once you do blepharophimosis correction, especially if you do medial canthoplasty, the lid is going to be tight for a while, at least for three months. So that will actually exaggerate process. Once the lid stretches back to its normal stretchness uh, kind of dimension, then you can do a tarsofrontal sling. So you give a gap generally of about three months after full blepharophimosis correction and a permanent process surgery. Sometimes these patients can even be operated by levator resection. Right, sir. And so the last one, a uh, practical one, uh, how to examine a very uncooperative child for congenital ptosis? Right. So in an uncooperative child, of course, the child will cry, but you can do what is called ellipse sign. When you evert the eyelid, it should spontaneously come back to its normal position with just a blink, right? If it remains everted, then that is an indicator of poor levator action. Or if a child has severe ptosis without a lid crease, that is again an indicator of poor levator action. Any head posture, chin elevation or frontalis overaction is also an indicator of poor levator action. When patients who have poor levator action, you can definitely go ahead with a temporary tarsofrontal sling to expose the visual axis and re reduce the risk or facilitate the treatment of amblyopia. 
Thank you, sir. And uh, the floor is open. Anything else anybody else wants to ask? Ruju, Subhav, Titi. And expert comments by Dr. Singh. Yeah, <laughs> expert comments by Mritika. I think you have made her job easy, sir, for her next class on August 25th. <laughs> this is difficult. Like I have to delete the first 40 slides of my presentation because really? he's covered everything. Now what but do can, I do? No, that is a standalone lecture. You can do whatever that is required. You know, patient. I mean, some some uh, some may watch just the acquired doses. They may not like my lecture or my face, so they may watch, simply watch the acquired doses evaluation. For them, I think you have to have a complete lecture. Don't bother about what was covered today. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. As we were discussing, um, like we could have go on, like not just two hours, we could have actually gone ahead with three hours or four hours of your lecture. So thank you so much for sparing your time with us today and for our postgraduate students also. And next we meet on August 25th, uh, which will be evaluation of acquired by Amritika Sen. So see you all. You don't want to miss it. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night.